see people vaccinated in the state of Ohio. I want to talk a little bit about that and really talk about what I describe as a sense of urgency. And so I'm asking everyone um, who's offered the opportunity to take that vaccine. It's obviously your choice uh, to take, but I would ask you to have a sense of urgency uh, about that. And the same goes for those um, who were entrusting with putting the shots in the arms. Um, those folks in the medical community who are doing this, the institutions that are doing it, we thank them for what they're doing. We also ask them to have that, that sense of urgency. Um, we can't control how fast the vaccine comes into the state of Ohio. And we know that there's a scarcity. Uh, we know that we have two streams coming in, Pfizer, Moderna. Uh, we hope those streams get wider uh, as, the, as the weeks go on. And we certainly hope there are more streams that are coming on, uh, more drug companies that will have developed uh, vaccines that are ready to go. So what we hope uh, will occur, what we think will occur is that that will go out like that and that we'll have more opportunities every single week with more uh, of the vaccine coming in into the state of Ohio. Uh, but we can't, while we can't control how much comes in every week, we certainly can control how fast that we get it out. And that is incumbent upon all of us Ohioans to make sure it gets out just as fast uh, as we can get it out. Uh, it is a life saver. Uh, we will never know uh, of those people who get the vaccine whose lives have been saved. But we do know that many, many, many lives will be saved. And we know that there's a moral imperative to get this out just as quickly as we can. I want to talk a little bit about that today. So who's doing the vaccinations. Uh, first of all, let's start with our pharmacy partners, Walgreen, uh, CVS, Absolute Pharmacy, and FarmScript. Uh, they are going into our nursing homes today, uh, every day, uh, and vaccinating uh, the residents and also vaccinating um, the members, the employees, uh, all of whom want to get shots. It's all, of course, on a voluntary basis with both the residents and the employees. Second is our hospitals. Um, had a good conversation with the hospitals uh, this morning, the CEOs of all our hospitals uh, throughout the state of Ohio. They are vaccinating our people who are on the front line, uh, our healthcare workers who are defending us, protecting us, taking care of our loved ones, uh, seeing things that none of us have ever seen uh, unless we've worked directly with, with a COVID patient. Um, and so they're doing it and we're very, very grateful for what they do. And there is a real imperative that they get vaccinated, uh, just as, as soon as possible as well. And then finally, the third group is, is our local health departments and they're busy. Uh, they continue to do the uh, tracing. They continue to do all the other things that local health departments do without a pandemic, even being around, uh, you add to that, the, the tracing and, and what goes along with that, it's a big job. Now, in addition to that, uh, they have some of the burden uh, and, and some of the opportunity to be uh, vaccinating individuals. For example, EMS, uh, our EMS squads are being vaccinated now by our local health department. Some of our congregate care settings uh, are being vaccinated by our local health department. So again, we appreciate them very, very much. And we thank them for what uh, they do, just as we thank uh, the hospitals, just as we thank our pharmacy uh, partners. So I said we had a good call this morning uh, with the CEOs of our, our hospitals in the state of Ohio. This has been a uniquely Ohio relationship during this pandemic. Uh, started February, early March, uh, when we tried to you know, really pull everybody together uh, we have a great relationship with the Ohio Hospital Association. We're sharing data like it's never been done before. Uh, we've divide, we divided back in March the state into three separate zones. We have lead hospital zones 
and they in turn uh, are there to make sure that the local hospitals that serve other Ohioans uh, are getting what they need. Uh, whether at one point it was, it was PPE, uh, now uh, focusing on vaccinations, but they're there to help. And that system that we established with the hospital association has been a system that has worked exceedingly well. And now we're asking it to do even, even more. Uh, we are asking uh, our hospitals um, that when they get the vaccine to do everything in their power to get that vaccine out into people's arms uh, within 24 hours and then to report it back to the state so we know what's, what's happened. We can show this to everybody uh, on our dashboard uh, that those vaccinations have in fact taken place. So we're asking 24 hours to get it in, 24 hours after that to, to get it reported. Now we know that that's not always going to be possible. We know, for example, that some of this may come into a bigger hospital then it goes out to a smaller hospital. And so there's maybe a, 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 some delay there. We also know that some of the bigger hospitals will get a, a chunk of it at one time and it's going to be physically impossible to get it out within 24 hours. But we ask them to aim for that and to do the best that they can uh, to make sure that, that that vaccine is gone, it's used in people's arms within that period of time. Let me talk for a moment now uh, to go from those who are giving the shots to those who are receiving the shots. I wanna talk a little bit um, to my fellow Ohioans who are in that position today. First of all, it, this is your choice. Um, we believe that medical science clearly shows that uh, it's the right thing to do, that it is, um, if you weigh any risk that might be there versus the gain, that the gain far, far outseeds the risk. And I think every professional has, has said that. But we ask you not to listen to me, I'm not a doctor, but rather to listen to the doctors and listen to the health professionals in regard to that. Um, one thing I would caution, uh, everyone who is in group 1A and who has offered the opportunity to, to get that shot. Um, again, it comes back to uh, a sense of urgency. Um, we cannot guarantee if you pass that up, there's no guarantee when you're gonna have an opportunity to do that again. And let me just give a couple of examples. Um, nursing homes. Uh, nursing home staff and, and residents of nursing homes. The way the federal government set this program up is that the pharmacy company that is vaccinating on the, our behalf will make three stops to each nursing home, three different dates they will come into that nursing home. The first date, they will vaccinate everyone who wants to be vaccinated, staff, residents. They will come back on a second date, three weeks or so later, and they will give the second vaccine to those who got it the first time. They also, at that point, will see if there's anyone else who wants that vaccine in the nursing home. After that, if you don't get your first shot, then we can't guarantee you when you'll be able to get that. I mean, it's... For example, let's take a 35 year old who is in a nursing home or who works in a nursing home. If they don't take that shot on that second occasion, you know, they may come into a simply a different category and it may be a matter of months before they have the opportunity to do that. So again, this is, everyone makes their own choice about this, but we just wanna make it clear that that opportunity may not come back uh, for a while. Now, our goal ultimately is to offer this to everybody in the state of Ohio, but we know that's going to take months. And so just a kind of a word of caution uh, in regard to that. Uh, the same way would be with obviously with health healthcare staff, uh, that opportunity again may not come back, or at least we cannot guarantee that. Let me talk a moment about nursing home residents. Uh, we've had uh, a large number of nursing home residents who are taking the vaccine. We think Anadoli, uh, it's roughly 80%. Uh, and so 
vast majority of people in nursing homes are taking that. Uh, I would speak now to family members who have someone in a nursing home. Uh, unless there is some reason that person, uh, your loved one, should not get the vaccine. Um, you know, again, you might want to talk to them uh, and urge them to do that. Again, it's their individual choice whether they get the vaccine or not. But again, missing that opportunity, there's no guarantee when that will occur. It could occur in a few weeks, but we just we just don't know. Um, so again, taking that opportunity uh, is really, I think, uh, is a very wise thing to do. Uh, let me talk for a moment to our nursing homes uh, who are doing so much and uh, trying to work hard to keep COVID out of the nursing homes. Very, very difficult to do when we have great spread in, in, in the community. Well, now the vaccine is, is here. Um, when you are called to schedule, and it's really a scheduling issue by one of the pharmacy companies, we would just ask you when they give you a date, do everything in your power to make, make that date. Uh, again, because that keeps, enables us to continue to vaccine, uh, vaccinate people at, at a high rate. And again, if you don't take that date, you know, they will push you back to another date and they'll come. But again, you're losing that period of time when you could have had the first vaccination and then three weeks later, the second vaccination uh, in the arms of anybody in your nursing home who wants that. Um, so just, just some, some things to think about. Uh, every week on Tuesday, uh, we are told uh, the amount of the uh, vaccine that is coming. Uh, so, so on Tuesday, yesterday, we were told that 69,500 doses of Moderna uh, will be coming in to the state next week. Uh, Pfizer, uh, first dose, 70,200. And also uh, from Pfizer, the second dose, the allocated to people who are getting a second dose, 98,475. Uh, so that is what will be coming in um, next week. Our dashboard also, uh, as of now, and we've had we've had some entities that have had trouble uh, downloading or loading, uploading, downloading, loading it into our system. Um, so we don't think this number is, is precisely accurate, but it's, we think it's fairly close. Uh, Ninety-four thousand and seventy-eight Ohioans, uh, as of a few hours ago, had received the vaccine. Eric, let's go to our uh, key indicator slide for today. Uh, and you'll see that we're, we're kind of back up here, unfortunately. When we went through the holidays, the holidays skew all, all kinds of numbers. Uh, and they're never really a good time to look at it to see what the trend lines are. We are back, unfortunately, up in the 8,000 range with cases. This is where we've really been for, for, for some time. As you can see, it's back up in this area. Uh, the deaths, uh, tragically, 133 reported. Uh, hospitalizations, 366. ICU admissions, 36, which is about the same as, as the 21 day, 21 day average. Eric, let's go to the uh, 1 to 88 county slide. And again, th this is a um, slide that you're very familiar with by now. And again, uh, you can see down here the the bottom is Holmes County. Uh, Holmes County is about three times, or the lowest of the 80 counties is about three times, even our lowest county is still about three times uh, what the high level is according to the CDC. Let's go to the other one. Again, Pickaway County at the top, 11, 11 times. Uh, Perry County, which is 20th, uh, about seven times. So again, it gives you an idea. This is again, what people need to look at, what you need to look at, look up your county. You can do it any day. Uh, we've got the data for, for your county. It always goes back two weeks, uh, how many no, number of cases. And then we, then we um, even that out based on population. So you can see based on population where the most spread is and where your, how your county is doing. Again, spread is everywhere uh, throughout the state of Ohio. Some counties obviously are higher than others. Eric, let's go to the next uh, key measure map. Uh, these are the key measure maps that we started showing you uh, last week. 
And these maps allow us to monitor the level of spread in our communities, as well as the burden the virus is placing on regional hospital systems. So again, this is really put in the form of a map, what we just saw in the one through 88. And again, the darker it is, uh, the more cases in the last two weeks. So you can get kind of an idea. You can look at your county, see how you're doing compared to, compared to other, other counties. Um, on the right, uh, we've mapped COVID-19 ICU utilization by region. Uh, again, the, our hospital people and our medical experts tell us that this is really the best way to look at what kind of a burden we have on our uh, hospitals, and that is to look at the ICU data. Uh, this shows us what percentage of all patients hospitalized in the ICU or COVID-19 positive is averaged out over the past week. This is done by region. All regions of the state have at least one fifth of their ICU patients who are positive for COVID-19. In most of the regions, a third or more patients in the ICU are COVID-19 positive. So again, what you will see is the darker um, over in the Eastern part of the state would be the darkest. Uh, down here, you look at the slide, the, the code um, zero to 75% ICU. Uh, and so this is the region that has the highest. Uh, this would be the region number three, uh, south, southwest Ohio, Dayton region, uh, it has the least. But they're all, you know, higher, certainly higher than we would, we would want them to be. But those are the two maps, really. You want to look at something, get a quick glance at it, and figure out what's going on in your county, and your region. That's probably the best way uh, to do it. Let me talk about our schools and quarantining, something that I've talked to a lot of superintendents over the months uh, and heard, heard a lot of reports from them. Um, as we said last week, one of the main goals of our COVID-19 vaccination plan is to get K-12 through kids back in school. For all parents who want their child back in school and all districts that want to be back in school, we want them to have the ability to do that. Um, school setting, uh, I think most experts believe is the best place for most of our kids to learn and, and socialize. There's no question that it also supports developmental and emotional well-being. It's critical that we ensure our students and staff return to school safely. And we believe they can do this now because of a couple reasons. And one is something I'm announcing today. But let's start with what we talked about last week. As part of the next phase in our vaccination plan, adults, adults working in schools uh, where there are children, will have the option to receive the vaccine. We don't have a date yet, not a specific date when this will start. Um, and so what we're asking schools to do is to come up with the precise number of people in their schools, the adults, uh, whether it's a custodian, whether it is a teacher, whether it is cooking in the cafeteria, whatever that person does, and they're interfacing with children, uh, we want them to be able to be vaccinated so we can get have the opportunity for parents and the opportunity for schools to put kids back in school. Let me also though talk about something else. Our schools have been doing a, a great job implementing measures with consistent masking. Phenomenal job, uh, distancing, great job. Uh, they've been putting up barriers. They're doing all the things that we have asked them to do. So up until today, we have followed the CDC guidelines um, in regard to quarantining. Uh, that's, that's what we have done. We have followed the CDC's guidelines. Um, this has to do with students who are in close contact with another student who are exposed to that student, a student who tested positive for, for COVID-19. For example, students are sitting in a classroom the way it usually occurs. Everyone has a mask on, but they're within six feet of each other. Um, more crowded than they don't have the ability to keep six feet apart. Uh, the CDC has called for uh, a quarantining of, of that particular student, the students who were around that student in close contact. Um, but we started hearing a, a number of months ago uh, from school superintendents who said, look, we're quarantining students, but we don't 
believe that these students really have been infected. Um, at least we're not seeing signs of that. Now, what we didn't know is we didn't have any tests to really to back that up. And we didn't have any data to support that. So we decided to try to go get data so that we could make a, a logical decision. So earlier this year, we pledged to look at the rate of COVID transmissions in our classrooms. Um, we asked researchers at what's called the Ohio Schools COVID-19 Evaluation Team, which consists of the Ohio Colleges of Medicine, Government Resource Center, the Ohio State University, Wright State University, uh, Ohio University, and the Post-Acute Rapid Response Team to help us by conducting an evaluation in our K through 12 schools. Their results support what we have been seeing and hearing anecdotally in our schools. And that is that as long as students in the classroom wear masks, as long as they are mask compliant um, and do the best they can with socially distance, they do not have an increased risk of catching COVID-19 from a nearby student who may have had it. Um, let me now go to uh, Dr. Vanderhoff, uh, who's going to give you a little more details about the study, and then we'll talk about uh, what our new recommendation is going to be to our schools. Uh, doctor? Thank you, Governor. Well, as you noted, our understanding of COVID-19 safety in our schools has been substantially enlarged now by two new reports. The uh, first is the one that you referenced, an evaluation of K-12 through students by researchers of the Ohio Schools COVID-19 evaluation team. The second is a report from Mississippi that was recently highlighted in a prominent CDC publication of uh, the December 18th uh, edition of MMWR. Uh, I'll start with our Ohio data, which involved the testing of 728 children in seven school districts between November 10th and December 18th. Now, among the students were 524 children who, while in a school classroom, were noted to be in close contact under the current CDC guidelines with someone with COVID-19. The others in the study were either further away in that same classroom or outside that classroom, but in the same grade. And here's what the researchers there was no discernible difference in the incidence rate among the exposed students and the students who weren't exposed. The rates for both groups hovered right around 3%. Now, it's important to note that this involved students in classroom settings, not in extracurricular or community or home settings. The Mississippi report I mentioned supports our Ohio data, it shows that the close contacts of children with COVID-19 were more likely to be family members and less likely to be classmates. Importantly, attending school in person or during the two weeks before being tested was not associated with an increased likelihood of a positive COVID test. So here's what we believe. As Governor DeWine just said, our schools have been doing a tremendous job of implementing robust safety measures. When they're applied daily across the state, our schools represent the safest place for most of our students. When you couple this with the fact that teachers and other staff will soon be eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccine, we really believe we have a solid package. Now we've known for some time that being in school is, as the governor referenced, important for students, for their academic progress, their socialization, their developmental and mental health. Now we have the data to tell us that school is also the safest place for our students, even in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. Governor? Doctor, thank you very, very much. Uh, so today we are changing our guidance. Um, as Doctor said, we continue to learn more. Uh, and I know that there's been a great deal of uh, pain and um, students not being able to do things because they've been quarantined. And I, I fully understand that. And I'm sorry that uh, that happened. But, uh, you know, we had to go follow the CDC guidance. Um, 
CDC guidance still uh, is is that it's changed a little bit, but still is essentially that. But based on the data we now have, uh, we're changing our guidance and are no longer recommending that students who have been exposed to another COVID positive student quarantine. As long as all students have been wearing masks and the exposure took place in a classroom setting. So that's the limitation on it, but we're, we're lifting that based upon the study the doctor talked about and also the study that we did in the state of Ohio. Uh, schools should continue to quarantine exposed students if masking and distancing protocols have not been followed. Now, I, I will say that schools have done a phenomenal job and students have done a phenomenal job and teachers have about masking. And, and that's why we're not seeing the spread uh, directly in, in our schools and certainly not from our classrooms. Uh, the school, this change does not apply to after school activities, including sports. Uh, ultimately, uh, this will be one more step to keep our kids in the classroom, which we know is where we want them to be. Uh, I want to announce today uh, the extension of the curfew. The Ohio Department of Health will be extending the 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. statewide curfew for another three weeks until January 23rd. As you can see, our numbers are sort of in a flux. Um, they're not going down. And we've got to see what happens in regard to the holidays and if there's an aftermath in regard to, to the holidays. And frankly, while these numbers, we're glad they have not, are not going up like that, um, they're plateaued at a, at a very, very high, high level. Again, as a reminder, the curfew does not apply to those go, going to and from work, those who have an emergency or those who need medical care. Curfew is not intended to stop anyone from getting groceries or going to the pharmacy. Picking up or carrying out or a drive through meal and ordering for delivery is certainly permitted, uh, but serving food and drink within an establishment must cease at 10, at 10 p.m. Uh, the extended order will be posted later today at coronavirus.ohio.gov. Uh, let me talk for a moment uh, about the restaurant and bar grant program. And the summary of that, uh, frankly, is that many people have taken advantage of it and some have not. And we would encourage those who have not to, to do so. Uh, there are approximately 15,400 on-premise liquor permits in the state eligible for assistance. Of that, roughly 10,300, about two-thirds, have taken advantage of the opportunity. That means holders of more than 5,100 eligible permits have not claimed their funding. Uh, each active on-premise liquor permit, uh, as of October 23, 2020, is eligible for $2,500 per location. Many of the eligible permit holders have multiple locations, and so they would be eligible for more. Uh, we've contacted every eligible permit holder by mail or by email. Uh, we've worked with our agency and our supplier partners, and we've also shared the details with media around the state. Uh, but of the 38.7 million we originally set aside to support liquor permit holders, more than 12 million has not yet been claimed. Process to get the money straightforward. We ask the permit holders to visit www.businesshelp.ohio.gov and input their permit numbers, tax information. Again, this funding is not competitive. So as soon as you permit holder submits the necessary information, we will be able to send a check out to that individual. Money does not have to be repaid. Uh, while the program is referred to as the Bar and Restaurant Assistance Fund, more than bars and restaurants have eligible liquor permits. Um, movie theaters, some bowling alleys, sports concert venues may also have a permit. And I'm surprised to find out, my team told me, some hair salons are eligible for the funding as well if they have a liquor permit. So um, anybody who's eligible, we encourage you to uh, go ahead and, uh, and apply. We are now ready, I think, for questions. Governor, your first question today is from Jordan Laird at the Dayton Daily News. Hi, Governor. You talked this afternoon urging hospitals and uh, individuals to take certain steps to speed up the vaccine distribution process. Is this in reaction to something you're seeing? Where's the state seeing bottlenecks in distributing the vaccine? Well, I think, you know, this is a big operation and it's going to get bigger. Uh, I mean, think about this when we go from uh, 1A to the next group, a lot more people are going to be going to be eligible and we're going to have a lot more sites. There's going to be a lot more places where people will be able to get the vaccine. 
and this is a you know once in a hundred year operation um maybe more than that but it's you know we've not had anything really like this uh where we've been pushing out a vaccine probably since i don't know how the polio uh vaccinations when i was fran and i were getting our our shots in, in grade school at mills lawn elementary school uh you know i'm not sure how that compared in size so that but this is something very very big and there's been no no dry run for it and we got to go do it and so we just i'm just watching numbers and i'm you know as anybody knows me very well i'm kind of impatient and i really feel there's a moral imperative to get this out uh, because we don't know um you know every dose of this vaccine uh can save someone's life and they will be saving lives we just don't know who so i think it's a moral imperative to push it out just as quickly do it carefully do it the right way but to do it as quickly as quickly as as we can and frankly uh being that impatient person the numbers that i was looking on our dashboard uh, were not going up frankly as as fast as i i thought that thought that they should uh some of that is there's been an input problem uh a problem and we're trying to work work that out in other words they gave the shot it just has not been has not been recorded but you know i i just think there really needs to be a real focus on this and we got to get these out because we got to stay right up with it because we're gonna, we hope the volume's going to keep going out and we know we're going to broaden the number of people who are going to be getting it we got a long long ways to go and this first group we need to get it done or at least well down the track you know we're not saying we have to get 1a done before we go to the next group we're not saying that but we got to be well on our way next question is from scott hallis of the xenia daily gazette hey scott well scott can you hear me now yes sir you're on okay, good sorry about that i was having a computer issue uh kind of a two-part question um can you give us an update as to how effective the mask mandate has been for like being in stores if you had any feedback or heard anything about how how that's going you know compliance and everything and secondly um not an important question but i've got a friend up in cleveland uh, who's been bugging me to ask you for fran's pie crust recipe ah fran says it's a technique ah but i'll ask fran if she'll post it i'm, <laughs> sure, I'm sure she will I'm, but she says it's sort of a technique you know it's one, of, one of one of one of those deals uh scott uh the mass compliance has been a great success uh if far as far as retail is concerned uh, you know we are uh, i get numbers uh, every every few days and um michael let's see if somebody on the team can get me those numbers so i can read them uh but they're way up in the 90s uh percent um look there's just a few outliers i mean you get you know you get outliers once in a while but uh very happy with that it's been a real real success a fundamental change we saw the change in the urban areas in in july when we put a mask mandate on in the urban areas and it went up dramatically we saw it in the rural areas when we started sending out people to check and 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 told everybody that was going to happen and you know almost overnight it got a lot lot better so it's a it's it's a program that's worked and we're very very happy with it and it saved a lot of lives we know and we thank Ohioans for doing it next question is from Jeff Reddick at WSYX in Columbus hey, Jeff Hello, Governor. Good afternoon. Um, wonder if you or um, Dr. Vanderhoff or both can describe what Ohio is doing to track the new United Kingdom strain of the virus. It's been detected in Colorado, but it's believed to already be out in community spread. So how is Ohio looking for this? Sure. I'll, I'll refer to the doctor. Doctor? Yeah. Uh, so thank you for that question, because I know it's been on many people's minds. Um, first, one of the things I want to make sure people understand is that um, viruses routinely mutate. They change over time. And it is not at all surprising that we are seeing um, mutations occurring in this virus. Uh, here in the United States, uh, we rely 
very much on the CDC for the genetic testing, the genotyping of the various virus strains. So we really don't have an answer to whether the specific strains they're seeing in the UK are appearing yet in the United States. However, I can tell you that we monitor uh, the uh, viral activity very, very carefully and closely. And um, it, it's very clear that in the United States this fall, we actually were seeing a, a mutation that had occurred in the virus that we believe made it uh, easier for it to spread and probably contributed to some of uh, the numbers that we have seen over the last couple of months. But that having been said, we should anticipate that not only are we going to see the um, mutations that are being reported in Europe, but there will be others. Good news is that these mutations all appear to be impacting the spike protein on the virus, and therefore, uh, we are confident that the vaccines that uh, are currently available will continue to be very effective even against these mutated versions. Next question is from Spencer Hickey at Hannah News Service. Thank you. Governor, you've talked about the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Could you or Dr. Vanderhoff discuss the differences between them, particularly in regard to storage? And accessibility? Sure, sure. I mean, I'll let Dr. Vanderhoff take that. And I'll, I'll exhaust my limit of my knowledge, but the Pfizer is, is, you know, the colder and you have to be more concerned about it. So, but doctor, I'll let you. Yes, absolutely, Governor. You're, you're correct. Uh, the, the, uh, the differences are relatively minor. These are very, very similar uh, vaccines, both are manufactured from beginning to end. They don't involve any live or attenuated virus. Uh, they both are mRNA vaccines uh, that, as I noted, are manufactured. There are differences in the storage, as you've noted. Uh, the Moderna vaccine can actually be stored in the kinds of freezers that many health providers have already. It's the same kind of freezer that, for example, is used for the MM. Uh, our vaccine, uh, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. So that's a good thing uh, in terms of the distribution of the Moderna vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine requires a form of ultra cold storage um, until it's ready to be deployed. And um, uh, then it, there, are, there are some other um, less um, cold storage options for a limited window. But, but those are the essential differences between the vaccines. Uh, I, I would consider them to be very close cousins. Next question is from John Bedell at WHIO in Dayton. Hi, Governor, when it comes to the changes in the quarantine guidance for classrooms, one of the biggest issues we're hearing uh, from school districts in the Miami Valley who have had to pull the plug on in-person learning is we've had to do so because we're just having so much trouble with staffing because of the number of people who are having to quarantine uh, because of exposure to cases. So my question is, will this new guidance only apply to students in classroom settings or will it also extend to adults in classroom settings as well? Uh, Bruce, you have the answer to that. Yes. I mean, I, I assume anybody yeah, in the classroom becomes the same category, but. That, that's, that's correct, Governor. Um, the, what the, the research that uh, I summarized really points to the safety of the classroom environment that we created. Um, it, it, and what we believe is that our classrooms are um, case examples of the benefits, the impact of consistent masking and um, other safety precautions uh, for COVID. Um, not unlike uh, the really great case example we have in our hospitals. So we know that in these environments where there is the consistent application of those safety measures, uh, we have very low transmission of COVID. Next question is from Andy Chow at Ohio Public Radio and Television. Andy. Hi, Governor. I wanted to talk about this rate of administration. This is something that we've been asking for a while now. We've known the vaccine has been coming for months. How is it possible that the rate is so low? Uh, only 17% of the vaccines that the state has have actually been administered. What do you say to people who say that this is 
a failure of leadership, failure of leadership on the federal level to create an infrastructure? Well, let me see how I can answer that. Um, look, we take what the federal government sends us. It's then our obligation to get it into arms. To do that, um, we have partners to do that. And I was talking to some of our partners today on the phone and our hospitals about that. I was also working with our local health departments and we work you know, every day with the four pharmacy companies. So uh, I think you can tell by my tone today, uh, I'm not satisfied with where we are in Ohio. We're not moving fast enough, but we're going to get there. And oh. we're, gonna, we're gonna speed this thing up. What are specific things that the state can fix right now? Well, we, we, we can fix when there is a hospital that doesn't know how to interface with our computer system. Uh, we can fix that. In other words, that means that they were doing the vaccines. It just wasn't getting in or whatever reason. I'm not putting blame on anybody. It wasn't, it wasn't getting getting there. Um, but you know, look, I had a candid discussion today with our hospitals and, you know, look, they've, they've gone through Christmas, they've gone through, you know, and I just said, look, we have a moral obligation to get this out. And there are people all over the state of Ohio who want it. There are people who are eligible for it now in decisions that we have made that we think are the right decisions. And we have an obligation to get them in their arms just as fast as, as we can. Um, and so, you know, I think that's going to happen. Uh, we had a very candid discussion today uh, in regard to that. Our health departments, we've asked them to do a lot. And what we can do, Andy, in regard to our health departments is just stay close with them. There's 113 health departments in the state. Most of them are, are vaccinating. Uh, they're going, they're, besides all the other things they do, they're out uh, vaccinating people, EMS. They're taking on some of the, some of the um, congregate care settings. Some of these congregate care settings are small, maybe four, eight people. And so, that's, you know, that's a slow process to do that. So what we're doing is every single day talking to our health departments. I'm not personally every day, do it once a week. But we're talking to our health departments. What do you need? What can we help you with? Uh, to, to move to move forward. Our pharmacy partners who are doing the nursing homes uh, are moving. Uh, they're on track. They're right on track. They told us that they would get this done the first round in three to four weeks, and we believe that they're going to do it based on the numbers that we're seeing. Our bigger concern, though, is the number of staff that are not taking. Uh, I don't have data in front of me, but anecdotally, it looks like we're at four, somewhere around 40% of staff in nursing homes is, is taking the vaccine, 60% are not taking it. Again, that's my message today, you know, just urging people, not gonna compel anybody to do it, but urging people to take, take that vaccine. It's very important. So that's, you know, if, you, if, you, if you, I change your question a little bit and ask, what are you worried about? Well, what I'm worried about is people who aren't taking it, frankly. Uh, and, and again, we're not going to make them, but we just, you know, wish that they had a higher compliance. And our message today is train may not be coming back for a while. And, and you know, we're going to make it available to everybody eventually. But um, this, is the, this is the opportunity for you, and you should really think about it, uh, about, about getting it. Next question is from Ben Schwartz at WCPO in Cincinnati. Hi, Governor. Um, you spoke today about nursing homes and mentioned the percentage of nursing home residents agreeing to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. I have a question here from a WCPO viewer, though, who is wondering about congregate senior homes that aren't considered nursing homes, and if residents there are included in the phase 1A rollout you've been speaking about today. I know congregate care facilities are included in the state's vaccine guidance for the phase, but uh, so I'm just really wondering when you're speaking about these nursing home residents already receiving the vaccine, are congregate setting senior homes included in that or will those vaccinations come at a later yeah. point? 
No, excellent, excellent question. The answer is they are included in 1A. Um, the decision was made that we start with the nursing homes because generally they have a, a more fragile population, but the four pharmacy companies we've had this relationship with, federal government does, they're taking many of these other congregate care settings. So what your listener is referring to is included in 1A and they should be, they will get to them after they do after they do the nursing home. Now, some of those congregate care settings who might not have signed up with one of these four pharmacy companies, they in turn would then would be done by the local health department. But again, it would still be in 1A. So the answer is yes, 1A. The next question is from Laura Hancock. And let me, Dan, before you do that, let me, um, I'm looking at some numbers that Michael handed me and, and we can get uh, you know, this is what our compliance report shows. Uh, we have a number of counties um, that are 100%. Now, that doesn't mean, this is just what our inspectors see. So, obviously, there's nothing's ever 100%, nothing's ever perfect. But a number of counties that are very, 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 very good. Uh, and I'm just reading here, Fairfield, Franklin, Licking, Delaware, uh, Seneca, Athens, Jackson, uh, Scott, uh, for Greene County, I've got Greene County at 88, so Clark County 84. So, you know, not perfect, but, uh, you know, at one point, frankly, uh, I'm sure I said we could get to 80 or 85% in retail establishments in Ohio would be doing pretty well. So we're doing a lot better than we were, and, uh, you know, we can always do better, but we're, we're doing pretty well. Hi, Governor DeWine. Um, I am just wondering, again, going back to the vaccination problem. I mean, Ohio's had 529,000 doses shipped. When you look at where the gaps are, like what's the number one problem? Is it hospitals sitting on vaccine? Is it anti-vaxxers, like numerically? Is it pharmacy companies that are supposed to be visiting nursing homes? Is the state having problems with data? Like where, where does this plot, yeah. like, Look, look, look I, I'm not here to do fault. This is not a day for fault. This is a day for inspiration and let's move and let's get it done. So, you know, that's what we're doing. That's the message today. We're not finding fault with people. Um, you know, this is, they're standing up a program that, you know, it's not been done before, but there just has to be a moral imperative for us to do this now. So we put, learn from let me, let me, assigning, you know, finding out what the information is and then getting better with that. Yeah. I, I looked at, I looked at what I was seeing and didn't like what I was seeing. And I talked to the people who I thought could, could change it. And, and look, I mean, you know, we may have trouble with, with the, the pharmacy companies in the future. I don't know that there may be something that comes up that I'm not aware of, but they're on track. They're on track. And look, part of it is if you look at the hospitals, for example, you'll have a hospital that sets up a day when they're supposed to get, they got everybody lined up. And guess what happens? Vaccine doesn't get there that day. Now we don't control that. They don't control that, but the vaccine doesn't get there. It gets to the next day. Then they've got to scramble and, 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 and re, redo that. I mean, what, what I'm, I, I put a bar up there today. I said, look, our goal should be for hospitals to turn it around in 24 hours. 24 hours after you get it, aspirationally get this in people's arms. Now, it's not always going to be possible. Nothing's ever perfect, but that should be the goal. That should be the standard. And then, 20, then, then you have 24 hours to get it in your records and get it into the state data. So we're starting, so we're seeing it on here. It's imperative because we have to be able to see exactly what's going on out there. And we have to get through a good part of 1A before we can open up to, to, the, next, to the next group. And we want to get to the next group. We're also at the same time managing what the flow is because we don't know for sure what the flow is. So not blaming anybody. This is just the world we're in. Uh, we're happy that we got the vaccine and, um, you know, we're, we're working, working our way, our way through this. With the, with the, 
with the health departments, they've got a big load. They have got a big load and we're cheering them on and we're trying to help them and we're giving the, you know, help that we can, we can give them. But again, they're just starting in this as, as well. So, you know, those are the moving parts. You can analyze what the moving parts are and, you know, we just got to speed it up. We got to get moving faster. We, we can't, you know, we can't let a holiday uh, get, get in the way of what we're doing. We've just got to move forward. And look, I'm not going to get into details. You got some hospitals that have been going gangbusters. I mean, they just, boom, knocked it out. You got other ones that didn't. Uh, you got other ones that it's not their fault they didn't because they got it in, they had it scheduled. And so these are all the things that are going on. And, you know, we're focused on it. We get it. And we know that a, a dose sitting somewhere, not in a person, is a missed opportunity. Now, it won't be completely missed. You know, the other thing that we have, we have told our partners who are doing this work is don't waste a dose. You know, if you get down and you've got a few and the time is running out, you know, get them in somebody. Get them in somebody. Because ultimately, you know, we're trying to get our most vulnerable people and we're trying to get, you know, every Ohioan to at least, you know, to have the opportunity to be able to take that vaccine or, or not. Next question is from John London at WLWT in Cincinnati. Hey, John. Hi, Governor. So, you know, so you talk about flow, and I want to uh, ask about the next group. O Ohio, you say, has vaccinated 94,000 plus in a couple of weeks. It's less than 1% of the population, I believe. There's like 17% that are over 65. Uh, so that's like 1.8 million. Next group in line, along with those in the school setting, the special needs. Realistically, given the gap between the available supply and the demand that there is, how long do you think, what are the experts telling you about how long this is going to take just yeah. for those groups alone? John, we don't know. I mean, here's why we don't know. We just saw in Great Britain, there was a new vaccine that was approved. We assume, uh, you know, our government will approve it at some point. We don't know that, but we assume that. Uh, we assume there's other vaccines that are coming on. So we don't know the production. We cannot predict the production. What we have to do in Ohio, and this is my appeal today to everyone who has anything to do with this, we've got to execute on what we have. When we're given vaccines, we've got to do everything we can to get them into arms just as quick as we can and get them into the priority groups that have been set. That's, that's what our job is. Um, and look, we should not be frustrated by not knowing everything of the future. You know, this vaccine was produced in record time. Uh, it is by every medical expert uh, who, who talks about it, uh, a very, very good vaccine. I'm glad we have it. Our job in Ohio is to take this vaccine and to get it into people as quickly as we can. And we're going to do it. We are doing it and we're going to speed it up. Governor, next question is the last question for today, and it belongs to Rick Ruan of the Columbus Dispatch. Hey, Rick. Can you hear me now? You're on now. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you about um, the, it's another vaccine question, but how uh, the relatively slow rollout to this point is going to affect uh, that March 1st date that you've previously talked about in trying to get uh, students back into um, in-person learning. I think you talked about that a little bit last week and, and wondering yeah. if this might uh, slow that down. Uh, it remains the goal. It remains the goal and we're focused on it. So no change. Appreciate it very, very much. Um, well, wish everybody a uh, happy new year. Uh, the first few months of this coming year are probably going to remain tough. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball better than anybody else's, but, you know, it looks like it'll be tough. But I think Ohioans, we have to continue to do what we do best. Um, think of a football team. Um, we got to block. We got to tackle. We got to carry out our mission. Our mission is to keep a distance, mask, keep a distance apart. Don't, you know, if you're with someone else, Wear a mask. Someone who's not in your household doesn't live with you. Don't eat with someone who's not, not in your in your immediate household. And we've got to execute on the vaccines. 
what we've talked about today and carry out that mission. So it's, it's basics, it's back to basics. Uh, we can do that, we've done it before, uh, we'll do it again. I wish everybody a very happy new year. We're gonna end on a, uh, with a video that we received from uh, our friend, Michael Dustman. Uh, Mike, Michael is the vice president of the Grove City High School Band Boosters. The video is from the Brook Park Middle School Band in Grove City. The video is a virtual performance of a classic tune from the Nutcracker, but with a new twist. Let's listen. Well, that was great. Happy New Year, everyone, and we'll see you back here next week. Thanks a lot.